This video shows how momentum and energy are not conserved in curved space-time as matter and energy respond to local curvature resulting in changes in the direction of their velocity vector which in turn results in changes in their momentum and energy. All right. In flat Minkowski space, an object with a fixed velocity will continue to travel in a straight line in the Euclidean sense unless acted upon by some force. So in flat space, represented here by this two-dimensional surface, um, you can imagine the three dimensions for yourself, but unless some object acts to change, unless some force acts to change the velocity of an object, it will just continue in the same straight line in a Euclidean sense. Two straight lines are parallel, um, never, never diverging, never converging, remaining the same distance apart. Anyway, so that means energy and momentum are conserved in special relativity. And I went through all that in the last video where we looked at that. Um, so see that video there. But in flat space, there's no reason for this velocity vector to change direction. It can continue with the same velocity, constant velocity, constant direction, constant magnitude because there's, unless some force acts upon it, otherwise the space-time itself doesn't cause any changes. There's no curvature in this space, it is flat. All right. In curved space-time, objects that are freely falling, that's following the curvature of space-time, that's not acting under any force or uh, being prevented from moving in any way, they're just freely falling, must move according to the local curvature of the space, which means that they generally don't follow the straight lines of Euclidean geometry. And you can have a look here, imagine here's this curved two-dimensional surface here, and you can imagine an object moving across it. You can see that its um, velocity vector at each point is points in a different direction um, as it follows. So as it follows the curvature space, it has no choice. The velocity vector of the object changes direction. So it, it can't be traveling with a constant uh, speed, constant velocity its direction changes. And that means the velocity vector of these objects changes direction, which in turn means the momentum and energy of these objects changes as well. All right. Now the conservation of energy is expressed by del dot t, the divergence of the energy momentum tensor equal being equal to zero, as we saw in the last video. Gauss's law, which we used in that video, shows that an integral over, uh, uh, over four volume here, integrated over a four volume here, uh, the divergence in energy momentum tensor is equal to a spatial integral um, or one less uh, over a surface, so a flux integral over a surface where n hat or n caret i represents the normal vector to the surface. All right, so we're going to have different normal vectors at different points on a curved space um, and that will have an effect on how we evaluate this integral here, or whether or not we can. Now, uh, del dot t, the divergence integrated over a volume, can be expressed this way. There's four volume there. This part here is the uh, determinant of the uh, metric, All right? This bit here, and this over the over some the flux over some surface t dot n hat whereas n is an outward pointing normal to the surface to some surface and in component form it's written this way so gauss's law in component form all right so let's have a look at this del dot t dv is t dot n hat da and um, so we're going to have t dot n hat at point p da and at some other point say q we're going to have a normal vector uh, at Q, which will point in a different direction, generally point in a different direction to P, and different points on the manifold, and that's going to affect whether or not we can evaluate this, because we won't be able to do that. At different points on a manifold, you can't add or subtract vectors. Such, are not, such operations, adding and subtracting vectors, has no meaning on manifolds, because at different points, the vectors share different basis vectors. And in the last video on flat Minkowski space, we were able to subtract normal vectors from each other um, or look at the fluxes, uh, the inner product of the flux with a normal vector, and then subtract that. And that's okay. At different points, you can do that on a, in flat space because it's all the one vector space. But each point 
on a curved manifold has its own vector space. So the point P, you have a set of basis vectors that at one point they form a vector space. Hence, for a two-dimensional manifold such as this curved surface, that space will be a flat plane, and that's what's shown there. So point P has its own vector space, point Q has its own vector space, any other point here has its own vector space. So we won't be adding or subtracting vectors on that, it's not possible. They have different basis vectors. And this result says momentum and energy is not conserved. There's no, uh, there's no global conservation of energy in general relativity because on curved manifolds you have this problem here. Vectors at different points cannot be added or subtracted on the manifold. And if you think about it, an object moving on this surface here, its velocity, its direction, its magnitude and so on will change. At one point here, it's going to have a different velocity vector to here, simply because the direction of those vectors will change at different points on a manifold. In flat space time, that doesn't happen. Let's just go a little bit further with that. So we can be, we can be a bit more explicit about this result because a little bit at the moment hand waving and talking about curved surfaces and vectors changing direction and so on. So let's be a little bit more precise about this and look at the components of the energy momentum tensor. And the energy momentum tensor can be expressed T is in this form here in the tangent basis. Here one index up, one down, or both indices up in the dual basis. These are the tensor products of the basis vectors. Now it has covariant derivative this, dd alpha, this is the del part, here's our tensor here. Now tensor product here, e alpha, partial derivative of the tensor components, mu nu. And again, product rule up applies here. So we have this bit here. So first time, first part was the partial derivative of the components with respect to alpha. Next one was the partial derivative of the E mu basis vectors with respect to alpha, the coordinate x alpha. And finally, this last bit here is the partial derivative of E nu with respect to the coordinates x alpha. The manifold is determined in terms of its coordinates, so we're doing the partial derivative with respect to its coordinates. And coming down here, let's tidy this up a little bit here along this bit here, these de mu dx alpha gives us these gamma terms here and then expanded out in terms of e delta, that's just the definition of the partial derivative of the basis vectors with respect to the coordinates x alpha, that's how we get the connection Christoffel symbols here which represent the connection terms, and this one here for the, um, the one form or the uh, co-basis vector or, or cotangent or dual basis vectors, basis vectors here, e mu is a negative in front, Again, expand in terms of E delta here. Okay, let's write that out again here. All right, and what we're going to do now is we're just going to tidy this up and the deltas here will disappear. I see how we've got a mu here and an E nu, and we'd like to have that at the very end, E mu, E nu, and, and the E alpha here. So what we're gonna do here is see that delta and that delta there, that's going to swap, uh, that's, uh, sorry here, that delta and that delta there is going to swap with that mu and that mu there. Uh, one index up, one index down means we're summing out that index, so it doesn't matter what we call it. It's not uh, a free index. So this dummy index can be replaced, delta and delta, with mu and mu, which we've done here. Delta, delta's gone there, and then mu, mu. See how they have swap location there? That gives e mu and e nu. And then here, we're going to, same thing here, we're going to do get rid of this uh, delta here and we're going to swap it with the new here that one and that one we'll swap places with these two and we end up with that and then what that means is we can factor out e alpha e mu e nu a bit there and then here's our derivative of our here's the covariant derivative of our tensor and here are its components of that covariant derivative all right Next bit. All right, so its components are here. This is the component part here. Now its divergence is where this uh, alpha and mu will take the same index, one up, one down, um, and that will then produce a limited number of terms, which is our divergence. It's the definition of divergence. So just by replacing alpha with mu all along here, uh, here, so alpha here with mu, all right, that gives us our divergence as opposed to our general covariant derivative. Next bit, we can rewrite this in a more useful form. 
that's this expression here, by manipulating the basis vectors and their indices. And we're just going to make use of this identity here, which found in a previous video here on variation of the metric determinant, but dg alpha delta dx beta is d dx beta of, and here's the definition, because the metric here components are composed of the inner product or scalar product of E alpha and E delta to give us g alpha delta. And then we're going to take the partial derivative of those with respect to the coordinates x beta. It's this and this product rule applies here. Here we go. And then <clears throat> this gives us the affine connection, the um, Christoffel symbol, gamma mu alpha beta, and here gamma mu alpha uh, delta beta, sorry. And then next bit here, mu delta alpha mu. All right, and so we get mu delta alpha mu alpha mu. Here we go, like this. Next bit, moving on. And what we can do now, multiply by G alpha delta, but, and you'll see why we're doing this shortly. And anyway, so we'll uh, multiply this across here, like this, and when we do that, the um, Kronecker delta will apply here, because notice there's a delta here, delta there, and then there's an alpha mu. So the Kronecker delta applies over the alpha mu, and here, alpha, alpha, delta mu, so delta mu, and when we do that, but what we end up with is that this becomes the alpha becomes the uh, mu and we get gamma mu mu beta and here the delta becomes mu and we get gamma mu mu beta and so we can see we've got two of them all right so that means a half times this object here gives us this all right now the symmetry of the uh, connection uh, coefficients mu beta can be swapped and so coming back to our original problem instead of beta I'm going to use delta here mu mu delta is the same as mu delta mu and that's equal to this object here I've just swapped the betas out to put a delta in here uh, next bit um, I'm going now to from a previous video on the metric variation we can write the delta the uh, metric determinant this object here is a half times this. I won't go into all that. That's in the video on metric variation on this channel. So please just go have a look at that. And uh, taking now the partial derivative instead of the uh, uh, delta variation term, we're going to produce this object here. All right. And that, as I said, was all found in the. So in, in other words, in, in the variation delta is replaced with the partial derivative. Uh, Next bit here, gamma mu delta mu will give us this object here, uh, as we found earlier. And so what we can do is we can rewrite all that now as this, putting a uh, metric determinant in here, and one over that. So one over that times a half times that that bit there. And we saw in the previous uh, what that was equal to. We can see now that that can be equal to this, as we saw in the previous uh, slide. This bit here times one on square root g. Now, the reason for doing that is that the divergence of the energy momentum tensor can be written as this. This is what we had earlier. And what we're now going to do is that this term and this term, see how that gamma mu delta mu, gamma mu delta mu, what we can do now is replace that with this. All right. Uh, and so all I've done here, sorry, is just see that delta there and delta there that can be replaced with mu and mu and this mu and this mu can be replaced with delta delta all right and then i can use the partial derivative of this product because when i carry out the differentiation ddx mu of this times this well this bit will cancel out with that bit and i'll just get this first partial derivative here and then ddx mu of that times that will give me this because the derivative of this times one over that gives me this object here. So I can compactly write those first two terms there like this. Then I have minus this bit on the end here and we're going to deal with that next. Okay, so earlier we found this business here. Okay, and then if we now multiply that on the right there by the uh, energy momentum tensor with two upper uh, components, two upper indices, sorry. Okay, we've got this object here, and just expand all that out. All right, now, G alpha delta and 
the delta there, we'll cancel that and we'll end up with T alpha, we'll keep the alpha up, but this delta and this delta, will this metric here will lower that and we'll end up with alpha here. Same over here when we multiply this bit by that, we'll uh, uh, the alpha and the alpha, so we'll bring a lambda down and leave the delta up, so lower the index. Um, and we uh, in here, in this case, G alpha lambda, T alpha delta, it's the alpha terms that sum out and we're left with the lower index lambda. So that lambda will be down here. Anyway, that's just going over that. When we do that, we end up with this object here. And we can go, if you notice here, that there's really just, we've ended up with two of them again. So we've got two of these. So a half times this, so if I multiply this by half, get rid of the two there and I'm left up with this object here. And that then means that we can, this, Again, I've just changed some indices so we can come back to our original problem here. Got rid of the beta, for instance, and the delta. Uh, got rid of the lambdas here. So here we're back to our original problem. So this is a half times this, which is a half times that. I'm just using more compact notation. This d new is the same as d dx new, just a little bit more compact. Easier to see what I'm trying to get at shortly. Okay, so the divergence, our energy momentum tensor in component form is then this, all of which, after all that work with the indices, can be written in this form here. Okay, that form there, and that shortly will be helpful as you'll see why. So let's come back now to the conservation of energy and momentum, which requires that the divergence of the energy momentum tensor is zero if there's to be conservation of energy, and that then means that this object here, this object here, this one, must be zero. Now, if that's the case, then we can take this bit here over to the right, and we're left with this bit is equal to this bit. Now, if we're going to get this to be true, the divergence of the energy momentum tends to be zero, then we want this to be zero and this to be zero. And what we're going to find now is that we're going to have a bit of a problem because that last bit here generally is not zero. In general, that is simply not zero, which means that divergence of the energy momentum tensor cannot be zero. These basis vectors in general, they change from point to point. It's not like flat space where the partial derivative of the vectors <coughs> In flat space, the basis vectors are constant, because remember this g mu delta was the product of the two basis vectors, the inner product of the two basis vectors, and in flat space, those basis vectors are constant, so a partial derivative of them would go to zero and that would disappear, but this doesn't happen in curved space. Basis vectors change from point to point. So if we look at this particular coordinate line here, then tangent to that coordinate line are the basis vectors. For this space, so basis vector at the point A is E1 here, at point B here, again, they, from point to point on this curves manifold, which is a two-dimensional surface here, uh, just for visual appearance, just for um, uh, it's a simple example to visualise, notice the basis vectors are changing at point C, pointing in a different direction to point B to point A. Basis vectors change from point to point, and at each point, the basis vectors form their own vector space, hence the flat plane here showing you for this two-dimensional surface, the basis vectors will form a vector space which is two-dimensional, hence the flat uh, planar surface. Um, but that means that on a manifold you can't add vectors at different points because they have different basis vectors, they exist in different vector spaces. Um, and that's at the heart of the problem of showing conservation of energy and momentum. So in a global sense, in general relativity, there is no conservation of momentum. And it's because, unlike flat space, you simply can't add and subtract vectors. So using Gauss's law there isn't going to work because the spatial flux at, at different points, you've got a bunch of particles moving into a box at one point, moving out of the box at a, a, another point, across one plane, across a second plane. You can't add the flux vectors because they exist in different vector spaces. All right, so we found that in general, this does not equal zero. So this tells us in general relativity, energy and momentum is not conserved. As matter and energy moves through space-time, the local curvature, which is the gravitational field, acts to change the momentum and energy of the objects 
passing through it. So in general, the divergence of the energy momentum te tensor does not equal zero. There are such a thing in general relativity as conserved quantities, but that's the subject of a different video that involves killing vectors uh, in particular directions, and you have conserved quantities. But in general, a general law for conservation of energy, of matter and energy, uh, energy and momentum, sorry, does not apply. The, gravi the gravitational field, the curvature of space-time, acts to change the velocities, the energies, the momentums of objects, and so momentum is not conserved in that sense. There's no global law of conservation of energy and momentum. It's not possible. Whereas in flat space, it is possible. All right, done.